Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. That is why I have got to catch him this time. To show these kids that the example he sets is a first-class ticket to nowhere. Oh, Ed, you sounded like Dirty Harry just then. Really? Uh-huh. We'll be fine. Coming at you in three, two, one. And Sunday night becomes Monday morning. The Unexplained across the UK. Howard Hughes here. If you want to get in touch with me, the way to do it is theunexplained.tv. That's the official website home of my uh, podcast. And everything that I do, uh, you can follow the link there and send me an email. Maybe you have a guest suggestion. If you do have a guest suggestion, if you have contact details for that person, that'll help us massively because we don't have massive backroom teams here. We are a little operation trying to do big things. Now, some of the people that we've talked to over the years on this show have been controversial in themselves. Some of the people we've spoken with have talked about controversial topics. And I don't think there is any more controversial than the topic that we are about to address in this hour tonight. There is a man who I've had multiple emails about over the years. Uh, emails telling me that I must talk to this man and that my show will never be complete until I do. So I did a podcast with him uh, earlier this year, and I want to introduce him to you now on this radio show. Other people who've emailed me almost uh, simultaneously, sometimes two emails on the same day, one saying, you have to get this man on, some of them saying, you need to talk about this subject, but for goodness sake, if you do, don't talk to this man. <laughs> that is what we're into at this stage. The subject is the flat earth theory. The idea that the earth is a flat plane, is not, uh, what do they call it? When I was at school, they called it an oblate spheroid, as part of many spheres spinning in the cosmos. Oh, no, the idea behind flat Earth. And don't forget, this theory was there before we had the understanding that we think we have now of the way the cosmos works. That was there hundreds of years ago and was itself disproved by people like Galileo. So the guest in this hour of the show is a man called Mark Sargent. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, growing up on South Whidbey Island in Washington, Mark Sargent began his career playing computer games professionally in Boulder, Colorado. From there, he spent 20 years training people in software. In 2014, he looked into what is no doubt the most ridiculous conspiracy theory ever, it is claimed, the Flat Earth Theory, and through extensive research, discovered that it wasn't so laughable after all. And he would tell you why when we got talking to him. Early in 2015, uh, he released a series of YouTube videos that have been massively commented upon called Flat Earth Clues, which delves into the possibility of our human civilization actually being inside a kind of Truman show. If you saw that movie uh, with Mr. Carey, then you will have understood that that was based on the premise that it's all a sham. It's all a show organized by something or somebody else. Flat Earthers think that way. So, uh, before we talk to Mark Sargent, let's hear a little clip from his new documentary called Behind the Curve. And there's the clip. So I'm going to play it now, stop, and then add it in, because it'll be easier for me to do that later. So I'm going to play it for you now. Okay, we're about to play it. The time I ever heard about the Flat Earthers was, I think, when I was in space last. I can't believe I'm talking about this. They was well-versed in just about every conspiracy you can think of. Chemtrails, 9-11. Did you know they made up dinosaurs? I completely saw the director of assassination, which I'll share with you this different day. And then Mark said that he was a member of the Flat Earth Society. And I said, oh, Mark, what are you on to now? Yes. You name, yeah. <laughs> so I love the way that ends. Uh, that is part of a promo for the documentary Behind the Curve. Mark Sargent in the U.S. Can you give me another counting, so we need to start off because I'm going to start recording again. All right, I'll, I'll give you a counting then, a three, two, one. So one. Stand by, Mark. Three, two, one. Well, I love the way that ended with the word this, because this is a massive topic. And Mark Sargent is online to The Unexplained right now. Mark, thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here. So, by the sounds of that little clip, I think it's a promo for your documentary, but uh, yeah. whatever it is, 
There are a lot of people who seem to be intrigued, who've had their curiosity piqued by the work that you've done. Yeah, yeah, it is. the. I've never thought when I first made the clues back in the beginning of 2015 that it was going to gain this much traction to where now, I mean, and this documentary, the, the thing you just played there, that was, that's not even my film. That was one of five documentaries that are being made by various people all over the place. In fact, uh, The Guardian, in your neck of the words, is coming over to the Denver conference and they're going to be shooting their own here next month. I think it will surprise people, and we'll get into the conference circuit uh, oh. later in this conversation, uh, that there are conferences, one of them this year was in the United Kingdom, on the subject of the flat earth. And yeah. there are sensible people who've come round to your way of seeing things. But yeah. there are variants on your way of seeing things. We'll get into that, too. Mm -hmm. um, first thing to say is that you are a popular man among some circles, but you know this, I don't have to tell you. Yeah. You have an awful lot of people, even within the movement, who don't like you. <laughs> Which is weird, because I'm I'm one of the nicest guys ever, if, what I've been told. Uh, yeah, the, the Flat Earth is a very dysfunctional family, and it comes mostly because of the open-mindedness mind you get from being in Flat Earth. Uh, everybody that gets into it gets really, really enthusiastic, and everybody wants to carve their own path. And it's it's strange because it, they you feel like okay, if I if you're if you're not with me, you're against me. And I've been getting kind of the the lion's share of the media, and so I, there's going to be some detractors, and I I don't mind. You know, it's it's just something comes with the territory. Some of your critics, by no means all of them, mm -hmm. say that one of the things that they don't like about you, um, and you know, you are involved in publicizing this and campaigns and outreach to schools and all sorts of things that they don't like about you, mm -hmm. is that you don't react with them. You don't get onto their forums. You don't, um, you don't mix with them. Uh, yeah, when it comes to trolls and people that are that are skeptics, I mean, whether it's inside or outside the community, uh, there's a there's an old saying, and I, I I put this out to everybody that's on the internet, and that's don't feed the trolls. They're they're just looking to push your buttons, and the conversation will never end. They will never ever stop. Uh, I engaged a few people in the beginning, back in 2015, but after a while, I said no, no, it's it's not how I, I, well, I, I listen. I understand that anybody who goes into these fields. It is one of the risks that you take, and it kind of these days goes with the territory. That I understand. Mm -hmm. um, there are also people who've com questioned your commitment to all of this. In mm -hmm. other words, they kind of imply, but don't always say, that they think you're using this as a vehicle to promote yourself. Oh, good Lord, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I uh, Look, I don't want to be famous, uh, not by a long shot. I want to be right. There's a big difference there. There's a lot of people that are, are famous and they know they're wrong. Uh, in this case, I I don't care if there's money involved really or not. This uh, People forget that I'm not doing this by choice. The Flat Earth just kind of grabbed me like an amusement park ride and, and is taking me on a journey. I, I don't know exactly where it's going. Uh, but as far as commitment goes, let me address that really quick. Uh, no one has put more into this than than me. I even put my life on the line. With my latest challenge, which is my spacesuit challenge, I challenge any space organization to loan me a self-contained astronaut suit, put me in a vacuum chamber, and pull the switch. Tell me how I don't die because the suit cannot work as as advertised. Physics w simply will not allow it. So don't don't tell me I'm not committed to the to the project, to the journey, to the cause. Well, I wasn't going to get into specifics like this now, but let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, this spacesuit challenge, yeah. then, I mean, you are saying that space travel as we envisaged it, and as we have done it, uh, right. it, is, you know, it is told, um, cannot be possible because the suit wouldn't work for starters. Yeah, it was something I came up with earlier this How year. Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and you can, I'll, I'll give you some terms that you'll know on, on your side of the pond. Uh, you guys, have called, of course, call them footballs. Uh, and that is take any inflatable ball. A football is as good as anything, you know, a basketball, a volleyball, whatever. But you take a football, right, you know, and, and you press on the side. It's hard, right? And that's because there's more atmosphere inside than outside. There's higher pressure inside the football, whereas there's lower pressure outside. You know, it's trying to get out, and so it's, it's making that football tight. It's, you know, like a, like a drum. 
And that's the same thing with anything you inflate, including balloons, including weather balloons. Well, uh, an astronaut suit is literally just a thick balloon, a thick bag of air. That's all it is. And if it is exposed, and you can guys can watch any video you want out there, uh, when it's exposed to a vacuum chamber, it should go as tight as a snare drum. And by that, I mean you yeah it'll be in the shape it won't look like a like a football but it'll be in the shape of an astronaut suit and it'll be like a parade float you should not be able to move your arms and legs definitely can't move your fingers damp definitely can't uh, manipulate complex electronics and build satellite dishes and do any work outside of a space station so why doesn't this does, does that not, i'm not a scientist yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have you know, a rudimentary uh, layman's kind of broadcasting knowledge of these things. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that depend on the mix of gases that you put through it? No, no, it does not. It is strictly uh, well, what you just said there. It's just gas. It's gas versus not gas. Um, it, remember, it, with the suit has to replicate what you're breathing now. And what we're breathing now is four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen. And a vacuum, there's nothing. That, that's the part that we don't teach to kids, which is it's not that the vacuum of space has like no oxygen, you die because there's no oxygen. There's nothing there. There's no nitrogen, there's no, there's no carbon dioxide, there's no carbon monoxide. It's empty, which means it's a pressure negative, which means the suit, all the pressure inside the suit will try to get out. The only thing that can stop that is a hard shell. That's all it can do. And, and the astronauts knew this, that the early footage of the astronaut suits showed them working with plastics and metals because they knew they couldn't figure it out. It's like, okay, and then they finally just gave it up and said, you know what, let's just use a soft suit. No one's gonna notice anyway. And it worked. It was perfect. People were running around the moon. They don't have to, it, they don't have any problems. There should be no articulation points. You shouldn't be able to bend your knees, your arms. You shouldn't be able to bend anything. And yet, when you see the Apollo astronauts, you know the Americans, the only ones that supposedly went, they have no problem at all moving anything. You know they're perfectly flexible. And we glossed over it. It's it's brilliant. It was a brilliant con. So running parallel with all of this brilliant con you just said, you think it was that. Um, running parallel with this is the idea that we didn't go to the moon. We oh. haven't got um, astronauts and scientists up in the International Space Station right, right now. Right. Uh, they, what do you, what do you think they're doing? Do you think that they're in a warehouse in Croydon or Pasadena or somewhere? <laughs> yeah. And, and let me, let me preface it with this because people are probably listening. Go, okay. What exactly does the flat earth look like? What I'm talking about here real, real quick is that you're not this little rock flying through the endless vacuum of space in five different directions with and precarious. You could be wiped out at any time. What I'm saying is you're living in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling this giant box, you know, with, with continents and a giant salt water lake in the middle with some, with everything inside it. Uh, and that our best and brightest, it was so large, in fact, so amazingly huge that even our best and brightest couldn't figure it out, the dimensions of it until about 1960. And when they did, they said, you know what? Let's just keep this one between us for now until we can figure out how to release it to the public. Here we are 60 years later and you know, we're trying to do that. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to the, uh, the United States space program, the, do not believe the Americans when they tell you anything in regards to space. Uh, the Apollo... And, and what about the Russians? Because the Russians have a proud tradition going back. In fact, you know, for many years, they were ahead of the Americans. Right. And the Americans invested a lot of money to try and get up to, up to speed with them. Are they in on it too? Oh, yeah, yeah. But only at the highest level. And you got to remember that back then, this, this was when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, they were the, they were working in a joint project out in Antarctica. They were the ones that kind of found it together and they needed the, the Russians help when when they did this. And so, yeah, there was this fake space race, which all of a sudden, you know, the Americans get there first and then uh, the Soviet Union just decide, OK, we'll quit. I've never seen that in the history of any sport or anything or business. Take your pick. I mean, where the Americans get there and then the Soviet Union just says, yep, yeah, well, no need for us to do anything. It should have been the exact opposite. The space race wouldn't have ended there. When we put two people on the moon, they put three. We put a small base, they put a bigger base. And then the cover of Time magazine will say, has the Cold War reached the moon? That's how it should have gone. And it was the exact opposite. It was like the Americans went there, they went six times, and then said, well... well it was more, wasn't it more... I mean, look, you know, I'm looking back through history, and I, I have studied at least this uh, part of history. Yeah. One of the problems was that the Soviet Union, as it was... Mm -hmm 
simply didn't at the time have the technical know-how to be able to do the moon thing. That is the, the way the story goes. And that's why they retreated from this and well, uh, allowed our, the Americans to seize, seize the prize. That's Well, that's what the American story is. It's like, well, they just didn't have it in them. It's like, really? Because they had a really big jump on us. You know, if, if you believe that, they were the first animal in space, the first men into space. They were logging tons of hours, if you believe that story. And then to just quit. And, and it, you, there's something the Americans don't even talk about, that supposedly the Russians had a probe on the moon that crash landed, that, you know, unmanned, that was supposedly there way before us. But it was all glossed over. It doesn't really matter anyway. All I'm saying is, is that all that is fake. And it is fake for a very, very good reason, which is, and I didn't realize this when I looked at it, I, the Americans over here, and I, I'm sure people abroad, have always been suspicious about the American space program. But I couldn't come up with a decent enough reason, which is like, okay, why would they fake it? You know, rah, rah, wave the flag, go team. No, no, no. Once, once you put in the whole flat earth and closed world box situation, they didn't, ha they didn't want to fake it. They had to fake it. Because eventually you, ha you have to militarize space. You've got to keep the private corporations, the big contractors, from getting involved. Because eventually somebody's going to figure it out. They knew they couldn't hide this thing you, forever. You just said you have to militarize space. Yes. You're assuming then that there is space. No, you have to militarize the illusion of space anyway. You've got to... You've got to uh, militarize what we are told is space but no no as far as space is concerned who who said when anyone says you know is there space well, you know what what is even even what's outside the box is there space outside the box i go who told you there was space to begin with same guys that told you the americans landed on the moon and then never went back and milked the same picture for 43 years those guys okay there will be and you know this yeah. a lot of people saying way to go mark but a lot of people shaking their heads over yeah. what you just said right um, in terms of the space race, right. how do you know this? Who's confirmed this to you? What, the space race was fake? Or that the yeah. space race ended the way Have it ended? Have you had people getting in touch with you uh, who perhaps were involved in this thing and who said, Mark, um, I see the work that you're doing. Right. I've carried this secret with me for years. I worked on the program. I know it's a lie. Oh, I, w I wish there was somebody from the aerospace industry that would come forward. Unfortunately, they're very, very but small. Isn't, isn't that where your argument falls down a bit then? Not really, because, I, and I would have thought so too back in 2015. I honestly thought when I put the clues out there that uh, some academic or some aerospace guy, someone along those lines was going to call me up and say, it's okay, here's where, where you went wrong. The math is wrong here. This is wrong here. And you can shut your, your whole thing down. But instead, I had subject matter experts calling me up almost immediately from just about every branch you could think of of the military except for nasa which is a branch of the united states military i mean navy air force marines army uh australia just about every pilot you can think of anybody that had to do anything with flight uh engineers um industrial guys uh, people that specialized in in vacuum chambers every one of these guys called me and none of them recanted and nobody came out against them they all said the same thing which is uh, that you may be onto something here. We've all heard of the curvature of the Earth. We've all heard of the Coriolis effect, the spinning of the Earth. But none of us use it in in our nine to five jobs. We don't use it in real life. It's just a, it's just a theory. It's just something on a page we're shown, but we never ever imp implement it. Right. You've said that there were people in other disciplines, yeah. not NASA. Yeah. who made contact with you and right. they were confirming that you might have something you oh yeah yeah i got a, i got a list in front of me the, the, i i'll list just the the first 10 on the list uh united states navy missile instructor air force navigator marine corps sniper instructor navy submarine chief army artillery radar operator and uh, australian intelligence officer american flight instructor industrial engineer career surveyor international sh shipping expert mm. corporate goes on and on i mean these people and, I was and one of the things that you said when we spoke on the podcast was yeah that um, if the curvature of the Earth was so, yeah. then we wouldn't be able to fire missiles in the way that we do. And I, I remember that I immediately got an email back when I released that show, right. and uh, it was somebody military who said, uh, we've always had to adjust for the, the spinning of the globe. Yeah, have them contact me because no one and I have I have not solicited all these people came to me on their own first guy I ever had was and this guy absolutely confirmed 100% on video inside the training uh, facility itself. He was a Sparrow missile system instructor for 10 years in the United States Navy. 
uh, and, cur- and was currently in when I had him. And he said, look, he goes, we're, f- we're hitting targets out at 50 miles, nautical miles, which is, I think, 60-something land miles. And he goes, we're hitting it, we're, we're, we're sighting it in with a two-degree beam radar, which is point-to-point. It's not bouncing off of anything. And he goes, because that thing should be completely on the other side of the hill. And I know people are listening to this for the first time. We're saying, what do you mean? Meaning the curvature of the Earth is measurable, if you believe in mainstream science, is eight inches per mile squared, which is eight inches per mile per mile. Uh, which means, so in other words, the missile should have gone as if you were firing it over the top of the hill, which should have gone over the top. Exactly, it should have. Yeah, it should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should have gone exactly. over the top of the hill. And but the thing is, the point is, you shouldn't be able to see the boat. That's the big thing. The boat should. Be- uh, we'll get into all of that then. We'll get into your beliefs about uh, the flat Earth and how this all works. Then coming next, going to take some commercials now. Mark Sargent is the man that we're talking with. Um, We're just going to have a conversation with Mark tonight, but we'll try and get him back on at some point in the future so that you can fire your questions uh, directly to him. But at the moment, we're introducing this to you, and I know it's controversial, but there's an awful lot more to say, as you will hear. Coming next, here on The Unexplained. Matt, have we got... uh, Did we get any tweets in from anybody? Were we able to tweet out about this? Really? Well, that's interesting. Well, I, David Ike, we got those. How, how bizarre. Okay. No, well, maybe they just... looked dis- over um, the tweet that I sent, and it seems like it was, uh, yeah, it's not getting any responses. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, Come at That's um, weird. Okay. Three, two, one. Mark Sargent is here from the U.S. Uh, he Give is... another go. Come at you in three, two, one. One. Mark Sargent is with us on The Unexplained from the U.S. We're talking about the flat earth. And we've talked a little earlier than I intended to, but I think we had to go there about why all this means, thinks Mark, and people who believe this, uh, that we didn't go into space, that there's no space to go into, and that in any case, if we did, it wouldn't work. Now, it won't be the first time you've heard that kind of thing, I know, on this show and other shows like it. So, Mark, let's get to the the nuts and bolts of it then. Uh, Do you believe that this world that we're on, whatever you want to call it, uh, we can't call it a planet if you believe it's flat, this world that we inhabit is like um, a dinner plate? Is that what you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, dinner plate inside a box, really. Uh, like, so it'd be like a Petri dish, a snow globe, uh, a pizza box, t- a planetarium, a terrarium. Take your pick. We all have the images of it. But yes, it would be a flat, circular, at least the water part, it would be a flat, circular world inside a giant structure like a Truman Show. Mm. And who would have decided to make this? Oh, you're and gonna when go. They've decided to do it. Gonna go straight to that. Well, it definitely wasn't us. I, I can <laughs> I can tell you that much. This is a little little beyond us. Uh, you know, we're we're the ants inside this thing. So uh, take your pick. You can really only go one of two ways. Which is, uh, you know, are we talking about an advanced civilization that is far far beyond our techno- technology, or are you talking about the divine? Which is why, by the way, you know, there is a, a huge religious contingency inside the. the flat earth community right now Hmm. and so when we look up at the sky Mm -hmm. let's deal with this one yeah what are we seeing are we seeing an illuminated dome yeah that's pretty much it uh and i know this kind of dates me a little bit and i don't know what uh, how how many planetariums you have over there in the uk but here in the united states we've had planetariums you know like the one that neil degrasse tyson runs uh, for oh, years, going all the way back to the 70s, where you just lay on your back and you project the, the stars and the moon and the planets on the ceiling. That's that's basically all you're looking at. And people are saying, well, no, 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 no. And I've had amateur astronomers say, well, no, I can see the, the moons of Jupiter with my amateur telescope. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, that's fine. Take a pair of binoculars with you to a planetarium and tell me, does Jupiter look more or less real when you're inside that building? And they say, well, that doesn't count. You're, you, I'm actually looking at a projection inside a building. I go, who's to say that when you walk outside of that one, you're just not walking into a much, much bigger one? And that's really what we're talking about here, a structure that's so huge and so advanced that even we, after you know thousands of years of our civilization, even we couldn't really detect it. And it makes some sense because you're, you're talking about we, we didn't even have the means to detect it really until the internal combustion engine came out. So up until the 1900s, there was no chance we were ever going to figure it out. And then even after that, it took us another 50 years 
before of searching. But, but why was it all made if somebody made it? Oh. Why was it all made so complex that the stars, for example, have fascinated man for thousands of years? Yeah. Cave paintings depict the stars. Uh, the ancient Egyptians were very hung up on the stars and right. knew a lot about it. The ancient Greeks were discovering, uh, charted the stars, and even had special devices that could map them out. Sure. Why, 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 that, why, why that elaborate hoax, if it is a hoax, um, keeps, and why, why the fascination? Keeps people interested more than anything. I mean, the stars have been used, and I don't want to use too many biblical references or anything, but the stars are a giant clock system. And they're there to inspire and to distract people. I mean, it's it's kind of like decorating the moon. Uh, you, you, you know, you, you decorate the moon with craters that don't make any sense, but they look nice. And so people, and we only show one side of the moon. It never, We never, ever, ever see the dark side. But the stars are, we use it for, remember, before the clocks, we used to use the star. We use it for navigation, and we use it to you know, predict when the seasons are happening, and you, even the time of day in some cases. And so it's, you are saying that the grand creator mm -hmm. of this entire hoax yeah. put the stars as we call them there mm -hmm. as a kind of elaborate way of telling time and we had to figure out how that worked sure and while and... we were spending our time figuring out how that worked so we could tell the time yeah. and make calendars up yeah. we wouldn't be asking any questions around um you know what is this thing that we're living on yeah yeah and th words, it was a big diversion is that uh, what you're saying yeah a vi well it's the diversion really was the secondary part the first part is it was really kind of a clock system because it is predictable you can you know things go over in a regular pattern and, and you can kind of fit you know if you have enough time and you live long enough and you pass that information down you can decipher the code but then the secondary thing which i thought was fascinating was the uh the zodiac signs in which you know people created stories based off of the stars elaborate myths Myths and legends based off of, you know, I never could really understand how they connected, you know, this dots and these, oh, these are fish and this is a hunter and that's a crab. And it's like, really? That's what you that's what you took out. But that was a whole nother layer. And in fact, a whole nother thing, you know, astrology is tied to that. In fact, some people have even called me, I mean, initially and said, you know, are you killing astrology? And I go, no, no, not at all. I'm, I'm saying, you know, the stars are still up there, but they're not these giant balls of gas that are ridiculous distances away, millions of light years away. They are much more intimate. They're your stars. They were built for you. Hmm. And what about those things that are incoming to us or pass us in what we call space? Things right. like the that large lump of space rock that everybody was fascinated by called Oumuamua uh -huh. uh, at the end of last year that passed this planet and so many others. Right. Uh, the Japanese are studying a, a large uh, chunk of space rock right now. I think they've got three landers on it, <laughs> we are told. Uh -huh. What about those? I mean, some of those things have actually crashed into Earth at the places like Tunguska sure. and caused enormous damage sure 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 well so, okay are they, they, are they being deliberately fired just to keep us um you know on our toes Is yeah yeah called? yeah a excellent instincts um anything that doesn't crash into earth is just an image i mean look we can put comets in a planetarium all day long and you're, they're not a threat to anybody uh as far as meteorites you know falling to earth that's a very interesting take because that would mean it's a little more than just a display system and it wouldn't be hard i mean come on we've seen science fiction movies along these you know gr uh realms where you could take uh you know just a chunk of metal ore throw it through a rail gun you know have a shallow trajectory and let the atmosphere burn it up hopefully you don't aim at any population centers and in fact make sure that most of the time it never hits anything near any people and except for that one in russia not the tunguska one but the one a few years ago where it got pretty close to a, a decent sized city uh everything's been working well okay and has anybody confirmed this to you has anybody, apart from what you believe, right. has anybody said, actually, you know, Mark, you're, you're on the right lines here, and I've discovered this, and I've discovered that, and if you go to this place, you'll see, it, you'll see a clue? Uh, everybody that's been going at it so far have been looking at the symptoms. You know, everyone wants, of course, to find the smoking gun. That, uh, it, But what's interesting is the clues that I came up with, which really didn't include any math at all. Uh, inspired people. The first thing that people did was they ran to the beach. Almost, almost everybody I knew that had a camera, they ran to the beach, and and I didn't even remember. And the, the clues I didn't even talk about the curvature of the Earth, and they all kept saying the same thing, and that is boats don't go over, go don't go over the horizon anymore. 
And then the next thing they did was start looking at uh, infrared photography and vacuum stuff and then the, the shadow of the eclipse and the, the moon temperature. The moon temperature thing I thought was fascinating. That, that was a brilliant, very, very cheap clue than just about anybody can see. Not as easy for you guys in London because you have more clouds, although I hear you're having a great summer. Um, which is that the moon temperature had. is had. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the moon temperature is cold. Meaning, uh, and, and I, in fact, I was into Flat Earth for like nine months and somebody called into my show and, and said, oh, yeah, by the way, the, the moon's generating a cold light. And I go, I, I laughed him off. I said, what does that mean? And they said it's, um, uh, it's colder in the, uh, in the moonlight than it is the moonshade. And I said, "How? Wait, 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 that's not possible." And so, I and I won't convert it to uh, um, Celsius for you guys, unfortunately. But we all know that if it's uh, seventy degrees in the in the in the sunlight, it's sixty degrees in the shade, right? We don't know that because the shade blocks some of the sunlight. But if you're in the moonlight, let's say it's fifty degrees in the moonlight, it's sixty degrees in the moon shade. It's actually warmer, up to thirteen degrees Fahrenheit. And it doesn't make any sense because, you know, at the very least, if you believe that the, the moon is reflecting some of the sunlight, it should be neutral at the most. It should never, ever get colder. In fact, if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight, you can make it even colder than that. And we've tested it in atmosphere. We've tested it in water with copper strips. And anybody can do this with a point and click infrared thermometer. Uh, you can do this all day long. Does that prove a flat earth? No, it doesn't. But does it absolutely put into question the relationship between the sun and the moon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very, very quickly and very, very easily. And we, and, and in fact, it's a technology I didn't even know that we had, which is, it's called a cold laser. We can generate laser light. We always thought that lasers burned. We can create it in a different spectrum that can actually cool things down. So why is the moon generating this kind of light on its own if it's not some... So you, you say that it's not telling us that the Earth is flat. Right. Just make it nice and clear. What is it telling us? It's telling us that there's no, uh, that the relationship between the sun and the moon are completely wrong. Meaning up until now, we always thought, oh, well, the moon is just reflecting the sunlight. And now we're looking at it and go, it's like, no, no, no. The, the moon is, is it's self-illuminated. It's its own object, which again w w fits in with the planetarium model. When you look at a planetarium moon, you know, go up there and there's a big moon. You can show it all day long. That's just an illuminated, self-illuminated object. The moon is there it has nothing to do with the sun and out in this world that appears to be the same thing you also talk about the curvature of the earth and we talked about this on my podcast right um flat earthers believe that one of the things that prove everything they say to be right right proves everything they say to be right, right. is the fact that if you launch a ship from liverpool or wherever and right. you send it out right um, with good optics, you can see it, they claim, far further than you should be able to if the Earth was curved, because the ship would eventually disappear. But, you know, I've stood in places like, I don't know, Southampton's a bad example, but places like the southwest of England, and I've watched shipping, yeah. and I've watched that shipping disappear. Right. And and that was, in fact, that was something that I threw at people uh, a couple of years ago, which was, I said, because eventually it comes down to this. Everyone wants to lean on the space program. It's 2018. Everybody loves the, you know, the space stuff. And I say, okay, tell me how you can prove that the world is a globe without using a space program or NASA. Well, just throw it away. And they say, well, why, 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 do you, why do you throw it away? I go, because NASA didn't invent the globe, obviously. We can both agree on that. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like we, we woke up one day in 1972 when they took the first picture and says, oh, well, it's a globe. Thank God. You know, and, and NASA was formed in 1958. But the thing was, everybody knew it was a globe 400 years, 500 years, uh, if you, unless you want to go further, let's just stop at Copernicus. Before that, we knew for a very, very long time. So and then eventually, and this we're circling back, eventually they'll say, well, I say, tell me how without using NASA. And eventually they'll say what you just said, which is, you know, boats going over the horizon, ships go over the horizon. We all know this. I had a guy, a Navy guy, write me um, just a couple days ago. And he says, he goes, look, I've seen boats go over the horizon. And I go, yeah, with your naked eye, absolutely. And up until about 10 years ago, I would have been right there with you. I would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The boat's going to the horizon. The thing that has changed is camera technology. Once we had the ability to put computers inside cameras, 
the game changed, which means uh, digital zoom with HD. So now when that boat is gone, you can watch it go and it's gone. In fact, you can let it go and then sit for another hour and it's still gone. And then you take your camera and you zoom in to where that spot is where you think the ship disappeared and now it's back into frame. And you can let it go again and you can crank up the zoom even further. And in fact, the, the Nikon P1000, I think it's got like 125 power zoom. You can see things way further than you should be able to. And it, and people say, well, it's a mirage and it's an illusion. I go, well, if it's an illusion, how can we target it with weapon systems? If it's an illusion, how can we target it with lasers? We, 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 that should not be possible. So what used to be the, like the standing argument or one of the standing arguments for the curvature of the earth just doesn't hold up anymore. It's, it, we can see it. And with infrared, it's even worse. Now we can see ridiculous distances. And eventually people have to admit, it's like, look, if it one the the bottom line here is this the curvature of the earth means it's the curve meaning it's when something goes over the hill it goes over the hill you can't look through the hill but now we can see it and and one of the arguments real quick is uh they say well if you're in new york why can't you see europe from new york and i go because people forget is this little, not lack of education but it's just something some things we forget is that you're not looking through nothing the thing that you're breathing right now is only 99 percent transparent it's still four parts nitrogen and one part oxygen it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and then eventually it's like looking through water you're not gonna be able to see it however i challenge people now and it's not it's not a not just word lip service which is if you took out the atmosphere, you could probably see a huge, huge amounts of dis distance. In fact, the world record photography right now is peak to peak. It's a couple hundred miles or 300 kilometers, but that's because you're looking through very, very thin atmosphere. Sorry, I ramble. No, that, that's fine. Um, it does sound a little implausible, I have to say. If I was to set out in a boat, right. a ship, right. uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland, yeah. and which sticks out a bit, as you know, into the ocean, and he'd keep heading south, right. you know, go right down to the South Atlantic and as far as I could go. Right. Then I presume as a flat earther, if I was to keep my ship fueled and keep it moving at a steady pace and go for as many weeks as I would need to go, right. I would eventually hear a big clang as I hit something. Eventually, at the edge of it all. Uh, yeah, yeah. Eventually, and and I'm glad you brought that up because it is one of the common misconceptions. They say, "Well, where's the edge of the world? Where's the edge of the world?" Uh, eventually, you will get to all. All roads lead to Antarctica. All roads lead to the coastline of Antarctica, which, of course, is the most unusual content continent we we have. Which is when you get to Antarctica, the coastline is not where it ends. Obviously, it's it's not like the Game of Thrones wall. Uh, but it is very, very high. It's like a couple hundred feet of ice straight up. And then when you get on top of that, if you can get on top of that, the, the whole continent goes up very, very quickly. In fact, most of the continent, if you believe mainstream science, is a plateau coming in at around 14,000 feet. And that's huge because, uh, you know, altitude sickness kicks in at around 7,000. And then you would still have to go inland, I don't know, probably a couple thousand miles before you ran into whatever the barrier is, whatever it's made out of. Uh, but Admiral Byrd and the United States Navy were looking for it from 1928 up until 1956, which was his last mission. And that's when and th they... this was a guy who famously sailed all the way down that coast, didn't he? He was looking for clues. Well, he initially Admiral Byrd is mostly known for a real, real quick summary. He was the youngest admiral in the history of the United States Navy, and he was known for taking a very rickety plane up into the North Pole in 19. 26 and whatever they found up there at which i do think was you know was basically the center of the world they they turned him around and the government sent him to antarctica from 1928 <clears throat> in his own planes he took a break for world war ii and then just kept flying around uh, antarctica looking for something i mean he flew his own planes uh, and did it for the better part of two to three decades. And then finally he you know, figured it out. And that's, of course, when the Antarctic Treaty kicked in. And the Antarctic Treaty, the, the most rock-solid treaty in the history of treaties, still unbroken to this day, not up for debate until 2041, that says no corporation, no matter how much money you have, no, how, no matter how powerful you are, no matter what country you're from, ever gets to set up shop in Antarctica ever, which goes against everything that we are as a civilization. So why are we exploring it? Why have we got uh, research stations there? 
Uh, we've got notable scientists visiting there. We've got scientists who are living there. Yeah, that, and Why that's it. Why are we it. bothering and if it's all a fake? That's just it. The only, what you just said, what we have down there is military and military scientists, period. That's all the people that ever have to go down, that get to go down there. In fact, I think even now, 2018, we've only got, I think, like all countries combined, less than 5,000 people there. And it is really, really locked down. And what I mean by that is I, I can't I can't really exaggerate this too much. Think about uh, British Petroleum, right? You know, big, big company, lots of, of liquid assets. Uh, they have the money and the power and the lobbying power to do just about anything they want. If if Admiral Byrd says tells everybody on national television in 1954 that there's oil down there. Why didn't the oil companies go down, including British Petroleum? They had a stake. They had they had researchers down there, too. Great Britain did. And instead, they locked it all down. Everybody got off the ice and they said, no, we're going to put a treaty in place. Nobody gets to go down here. That's not just the part that bugged me. What bugged me is, is that none of those oil companies, and I'm going to target the oil companies here, they weren't even allowed to talk about it. Because if it was me, if I ran a British Petroleum, I'd run a full page ad every month in the in the London Times saying, starting from 1960 and saying how great it would be for us to go down there. And I would lobby the hell out of that thing. And they're not even allowed to do that. It is one of All the... Right. Uh, we've got Sorry. to take a break. More commercials here. Mark Sargent is here. We're talking about the flat earth. Um, and the Antarctic being the edge of everything yeah. somehow and the powers that be wanting to keep that a secret. Now, if that sounds unlikely to you, it sounds unlikely to a lot of people. But I have to tell you that in this day and age, weirdly enough, we are obsessed by technology. A lot of us live our lives by it. But it would appear that more and more people actually believe this and that's why we're talking to mark stand by for more coming right up uh coming at you in three the next band will be shorter won't it yeah okay so you need to give me a count in for the wine i can't hear you i'll be about around 14 13 minutes okay and then i need to do the, the conclusion so we're yeah, going, going for a conclusion we're going yeah. for a third band okay three two one we're talking flat earth with mark Sargent. What do you think then, Mark, mm -hmm. is at the edge of it all? Uh, assuming that the, 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 the land that we live on is a big dinner plate, right. and it's all entirely flat, right. and we haven't even talked about the sun yet, but assuming it's all perfectly flat, right. if you go in any direction, you're going to hit something, aren't you, eventually? Yeah. There is something, there's going to be an ice wall there, right. you say, <clears throat> and beyond that is something. Right. But Event you don't seem to know what. Well... <sighs> To dealer's choice on this one because when you get out there uh, w what kind of barrier are we talking about and I get that question a lot which is what does the edge of the world look like what what kind and which is by the way one of the big reasons why you would never let a corporation down there uh, think about this if you have a massive um, company that's down there especially like an oil and gas company they're gonna be sending helicopters they're gonna be sending planes they're gonna be sending teams out and they're gonna be encroaching and encroaching and encroaching and eventually you have to have a cutoff point especially if you're the military, you're going to say, okay, you can't go past this. And then those companies are going to come back and say, why? And you're going to have to make up some story. And eventually you're going to get a rogue plane that's going to go snow blind and they're going to go off somewhere. They're too far. You can't risk it. And so, which is why I said in the clues that this is the one conspiracy that's actually bigger than money because they said, they realized there, there would be too many loose ends to tie up. So they said, okay, what do we do? How do we stop these corporations from getting too far? And it's like, why don't we just stop them entirely? Let's just shut the whole thing down and not let anybody go to Antarctica except for some tourists who can take their pictures with penguins on the coast. But if, let's say, but, let's say... But, a, but isn't, isn't the reason that those areas, right. the Arctic and the Antarctic, um, are virgin territories that are unspoiled, right. they also have effects and impacts upon our climate, mm. Uh, you mess it, you mess with them at our peril. Isn't that the reason why uh, there is, you know, there's an effective block on just anybody going down there and setting up shop? Well, yeah. Now, now you can you can throw in an environmental treaty over the top of it. In fact, it's it's a good veneer over the top of the real reason. You got to remember that. Yeah, of course, we're environmentally conscious now in 2018. We have been for a while, but not back in 1959. Not back in 1958 when when they were doing things. I remember Greenpeace was 
wasn't even founded until the early 70s. And it was very, very small. Environmentalism wasn't even a word back then. Uh, no corporations didn't hit the brakes for anybody back then. This this was orchestrated from day one. But let's say, for example, a plane, let's say you're a British Petroleum and you get down there and your plane, you're off course, your navigation systems are off and you just keep flying. You have a lot of gas. Eventually, you're going to get near to eventually, let's say you have a lot of gas uh, to whatever the edge of this, of this thing is. What's it made out of it? Is it a, is it a heavy element? Is it a heavy water? Uh, is it made out of ice? Is it a, is it a high frequency? Is it frequency modulation? Is it a force field? Don't know. But whatever it is, is obvious enough that when they discovered it in 1956, let's say it was 1956, they said, yeah, we, we just can't take the chance with people knowing. And the big reason, and eventually I, I have to get this one out, the big reason why you can't let people see this is because human beings have a real, real problem with confinement. Nobody likes going to jail. Everybody's got fences on their property, but, you know, but nobody... So you're saying that one of the major reasons for maintaining this calm, as you've called it, right. is to stop people freaking out that they're enclosed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nobody... Because nobody, it changes the dynamic of everything. You know, you're not in this... Ve Does you're, it? You're, well, yeah, it does. I mean, and I don't want to necessarily go into the potential shockwaves that would go through academia and economics and religion, but you're, the, the short, short version is you're turning a giant universe into a studio apartment. And you're doing it instantly, uh, you know, after 500 years of telling people, you know, this endless expanse. And you think if people were told the truth, Mark, they'd go stir crazy? Not necessarily stir crazy, but the powers that be don't like taking chances. So if there's a 10, I mean, think, think of the, 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 the quick shockwaves, uh, academia, uh, astrophysics and astronomy would have to shut their doors tomorrow. They don't reopen. And all the remaining sciences, uh, biology, archaeology, geology, hydrology, take your pick. They will all have to be retooled from the ground up. But, but at the moment, you're saying that all the astrologers, all the scientists, all of those people who are researching space, all of those people who say they've traveled in space, all of them, thousands of them are right. in on it. No, no, not at all. No, not at all. And, and thank you for bringing that up. Because most people say, well, you're talking about something that's bigger than the Manhattan Project, where the United States was building the atomic bomb, and we had a whole bunch of people working on it, but it was compartmentalized. Not many people knew exactly what they were building. They just knew they were refining this and working on this. When it comes to this, uh, you know, the space age, you know, space race and everything, no, astronomers don't know. Uh, scientists don't know. But the only people that would know ever, in fact, uh, I don't even think the astronauts outside of Apollo knew. Uh, the, the new people that supposedly are in the ISS, I don't think they know. They're just Air Force employees. They're just military guys. Sign the disclosure agreements. It's above their pay grade to know exactly why they're doing what they're doing. When it comes to this... And what about the dramatic... I'm sorry to interrupt you because there yeah. are a zillion things going through my mind I know. I know. But what about the dramatic return of Apollo 13, the crippled ship <laughs> in 1970, wasn't it? Yeah. That was brought back from the moon, saving the lives of the astronauts on board. Right. Um, was that all a fake? That was all just theater. Nothing, nothing more. Um, it, Apollo was just there to reinforce space. Every mission you've ever seen, everything the Americans have talked about uh, and the European agencies. Remember, all the wrench turners, everybody on the ground, they don't know anything. Nobody that builds the rockets know anything. It's just all right. So they, they call that plausible deniability. That's the people lower down. Oh, Nobody yeah. knows all of it. Uh, so, I mean, all right. No, no difference. What, than... what about the people who died in pursuance of the space program? The astronauts who perished on the launch pad in one of the early Apollo missions because they had the wrong mix of gas in their capsule. Oh, Gus Grissom. Um, <laughs> Gus, Gus Grissom and his three-man team, uh, yeah, he didn't die. Now, he did die, but he didn't die because of, uh, of a malfunction. He died because he criticized the program. He was one of the early... In fact, he was supposed to be the first man on the moon, but he was extremely critical of the well, te that... technology. He said that it was not well, going to... Are, uh, are you claiming that he was uh, done away with? Of course, of course, he was done away with. There was. I'm sorry. There's. And and I'm. Oh, I'm I mean, not. That's 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 a big claim, and I'm sure his family would find that very disrespectful. Uh, have you, have you, do you actually say that at conferences you go to? I, I, any any chance I get. Look, I'm not one of those guys that that will toe the conspiracy line and say that you know s things happen for innocent reasons. I mean, there's when it comes. I like to put myself in the other people person's shoes. If I you know when it comes to the government, he was a problem. And he had to be dealt with. He he hung a freaking lemon on a coat hanger 
uh, at, you know, in front of every NASA engineer that was out there saying, look, this capsule is not going to get the job done. I don't know what you guys are doing, but this ain't going to happen. You can't have and that. And what about the crew of the space shuttle in 1986? Um, including the the teacher, Krista McCullough. Oh, that's are you saying that they they no were no 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 to a fraud? No no no. They that was different. That by that time they had gotten their stuff a lot more refined. The, remember, no. What I'm saying is, no astronauts ever been on a top of a rocket. They've never been put a person on the top of a pile of liquid explosives. It's a really really bad idea, especially since rockets go wrong all the time. And so usually they put them off in an air force base somewhere, and then you know they either pick them up in the water, or now everything landed in Russia, but they pick them up later. When it came to the space shuttle thing, yeah, the rocket blew up. It detonated. Those guys, and, okay. and you can look up the pictures, they're all alive, except for the one guy who died of probably natural causes. They just changed their name. They put them into witness relocation. They're all professors. They're all running around. Or think say about they it before you do this, Mark. Hmm? Answer me this question. Yeah. And, and think about it before you do. Okay. Do you sincerely, truly believe this? Oh, I, I'll insert the pause here. Yeah, yeah, I do. I And I didn't. Here's the thing. Nobody that gets into this topic, nobody thinks it's a good idea. I hated Flat Earth. Everybody thinks it's a it's a terrible, terrible thing. Everybody in the conspiracy world knows their, their top 10 conspiracies, and Flat Earth is not one of them. It's the worst thing you could ever, ever come up with. Everybody that gets into it tries to debunk it. Anyone that's listening to this, if you like the life the way you like it, you don't look into this because you'll start to pull on threads and it'll never end. It'll never, ever end. But absolutely, I believe it 100%. This is the world is not what you think it is. It, we, it, why should it surprise people? The science fiction stuff that we've come up with. Think of all the science fiction stories we've had over the years. Think of them each as a lottery ticket, right? One of them was going to be right. We've covered all the possibilities of what this world could be. And in different books and movies and television shows. And one of them was going to be right. Now, of course, we've been, the science has always pitched. Oh, no, we're this ball and the Big Bang and dark matter and gravity and all this other stuff. Right. But it's all math. That's all it is. It's just computations. All right. All right. We're coming to the end of this mm -hmm. uh, fascinating conversation, which a lot of people will disagree with. I have a feeling I'm oh, going to get those emails I'm and sure. they're probably emailing already. I'll see them all when the show's over. <laughs> if... The Earth, and I know you don't believe it is, mm -hmm. was an oblate spheroid, as I was taught when I was at school. Right. It's a planet spinning in space along with zillions of other planets in other places. But right. our planet in particular, our very special planet, <laughs> spinning in space, we have a moon, we have a sun mm -hmm. that we're told gives us life, gives us heat, gives us energy. Right. Now, if we were spinning in space, mm -hmm. then we would have day and night when we were away from the sun. Right. Uh, as, the, as we move and as the sun is out there, uh, there would be a variation of seasons. Right. Hold on, those things happen. Yeah, they do. That must mean that we are an oblate spheroid spinning <laughs> in space, surely. Unless... Or does that mean that somebody's got temperature controls and light controls up there and they're putting all of that on as a show? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing is just a giant machine. That's that's all it, all it ever was. All the world's a stage, is, or so Shakespeare said. Uh, the sun and the moon are these tiny lights in the sky, tiny by comparison. The, the sun is not 93 million miles away, and the, the moon is not 237,000 miles away. They are tiny lights. Now, you have conferences. Uh, we're coming to the end of this very yeah, yeah, badly, but yeah. you go to conferences. You are a keynote speaker at conferences. Yeah. Um, I think you've just been to one. There are a couple of flat earth conferences mm -hmm. um, every year, and people pack them out. Yeah. What sorts of things are talked about there? Do you all go around agreeing with each other? Uh, y yes, <laughs> we do. Although there is going to be a debate this year uh, in Denver. They're the, the creator of the movie the principal, uh, Robert Sengenis, is going to debate one of our guys. He made a movie saying that the Earth was the center of the solar system, uh, and he wants to debate. So it's kind, of, it's a little bit, you know, he's he's sort of in the same ballpark, but he has a lot of points that he wants to make. But yeah, we talk about all the stuff I'm talking now and a lot more. Uh, the Denver conference goes on for two days, and I am speaking and giving out uh, the video awards at the video award show on the end of the second night. Okay, last question, yeah. quick answer if you could. Yeah. Do you believe that the truth of all of this will eventually filter out to all of us? Is somebody going to spill the beans? Yeah, I do, but I think it's even bigger than that. I don't think it's going to be a whistleblower. I think this thing's being let out for a reason. We've run into token resistance. 
uh, from internet searches and out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Al the algorithms aren't stopping us. If you wanted to shut this thing down, if you really wanted to hurt it, you could do it with software very, very easily. And we're not doing that. They're not doing that. Um, academia, you know, won't organize a defense against it, even though we're into the school systems at this point. So yeah, I do think it's going to come out. I think it's being. I think it's part of well, a bigger you picture. Know, people believe in unicorns. Believe, people believe in specters. Mm. People believe in all kinds of things, sure. and nobody stops them. So I don't think that they're going to shut you down in a hurry, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean to say that what you're saying is 100% right. It's fascinating to talk about. It's even more fascinating to contemplate. And Mark Sargent, nice to talk with you again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And what's your website if people want to read more? Uh, just go to enclosedworld.com or Google Flat Earth Clues. Mark Sargent, thank you for that. We're out of time. This has been another... What other, what other program could it possibly be? This has been another edition of The Unexplained. Back next week at 10 o'clock, Paul Ross follows us. Thank you very much to producer Matt, to technical producer Holly, and above all, to you for being part of this. My name is Howard Hughes. This has been The Unexplained, and please stay safe, stay calm, and above all, please stay in touch. Thanks very much. Take care. Good night. Oh, Mark, thank you for that. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> It's all good stuff. And I'm going to watch some more of this video material. You know, I find it fascinating to think about. Yeah. When you start, you're, you're right about it being like a pullover, that you pull it. And then you start unraveling the thread. If you start thinking about, well, yeah, I, I, I must admit, I do see ships go further than I think they might. And they right. shimmer in the sunlight and all the rest of it. But um, it, I, it's a fascinating thing to talk about. I hope that was okay for you. Oh, no, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mark, we will talk again. All Take right. Care. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks bye -bye. very much for that, Mark. That was great. Cheers, Mark. Bye-bye.